Hello, and welcome to another video from the Transnational Institute. My name's Arun Kundanani, and in this series of interviews, we meet people who can lay out a different vision of what global security should look like in an era of pandemics and climate breakdown. One of the people I really wanted to meet is Olufemi Taiwo. He's an assistant professor at Georgetown University in Washington, DC, and doing really interesting thinking about the question of race and security. In particular, he had an article in the magazine E.ON in 2020 called Who Gets to Feel Secure, which I highly recommend. In this interview, we talk about uh, the question of security in a context of racial capitalism and why the left needs to develop its own language of security. Uh, remember, if you enjoy the interview, please like and subscribe and look out for more interviews in the coming weeks. Olufemi Taiwo, uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, I want to begin by asking about how the left thinks about security. So often uh, when we talk about security on the left, it's in a negative way. Um, we, we talk about things like policing and, and surveillance and so forth. Uh, but you've written about an overlooked radical history of thinking about security. Uh, can you tell us uh, what that history tells us about what security means? So I think that there's been um, a radical history, in some cases explicit, in some cases implicit, of thinking about the role of security in a materialist conception of freedom. So materialism is just um, a way of thinking about what's important. It's the kind of philosophy that Marx and other people like that do. They think um, relationships over um, the world, natural resources, property, physical things um, have a certain kind of pride of place in the way that we should think about politics. And from that perspective, it's actually quite important that we have secure access to things like food, housing, water, the kinds of things that are the basis of any free group of people, the basis of any self-determining group of people. You know, basic things that you would need to have if you wanted to have um, something like um, self-sufficiency or even sufficiency in a solidarity economy. You would want to have secure access to those things. And the reason why many people on the left haven't thought of security in those terms in recent years is just because of the overwhelming kind of political domination of um, private security and state security in the form of uh, policing, um, military uses of power in kind of setting the conversation about what security means. When security is used simpliciter, when security is used without any other explanation, it's usually that version of security that's being referred to. Um, and so the left has um, kind of internalized that to some degree. Mm hmm you argue that, that any politics of security is tied to racial capitalism. Can you explain what you mean by racial capitalism and how it imbricates with issues of security? Yeah, so the basic thing that I mean by racial capitalism is itself tied to this issue of security. I really like um, Ruth Wilson Gilmore's definition of racism, which is in terms of security. She says, Racism is the um, non-state or state-sanctioned um, production and exploitation of what she calls group-differentiated uh, vulnerability to premature death, which is really, um, I think, a powerful way of saying why material security matters. It's not just as though you're going to feel worse if you don't have secure access to housing or food or water, but you are more likely to die sooner, right? And so from that perspective, um, these, group these group differences and vulnerability to those things are essentially races on this viewpoint. And since we could go back as far as Columbus if we'd like, but um, since large powers started putting together a world system, based on large-scale colonization, large-scale trade. Um, they have built social systems around these kinds of differences. The actual content of the hierarchies has changed a lot over time. 
In some cases, there were um, complicated ones where um, the focus was um, settler wars of native elimination. In some cases, it was war centered around anti-Blackness. The more recent centuries have combined those to some degree. But the basic racial hierarchy, what racial hierarchy is, at the end of the day, is this kind of hierarchy in security. Right. And, and how does that look internationally today? I mean, you talked about this long history um, going back centuries, but is there more we can say about how those racial hierarchies play out internationally today across the world in terms of security? Yeah, in some ways, racial hierarchies are um, more visible or perhaps more consistent at the international level than at the national level. You know, a lot of times people try to make the, I think, correct and valid point that the particular way that racial dynamics play out in the United States is, is meaningfully different from the way that it plays out in France or the ways that it plays out in South Africa, all of which is true, um, all of which is worth highlighting in a media environment where the U.S. plays such an outsized role in how we understand things. Um, but if you look across countries, um, and you look at the hierarchies of income, the hierarchies of um, environmental vulnerability, the hierarchies of all those kinds of vulnerabilities that play into premature death, the predominantly blacker countries face worse problems in 2021, same way they did 100 years ago. And the predominantly wider countries face lesser of those, right? And there's all kinds of interesting stuff happening in the middle. Um, and, you know, it's not as though race is the only variable in this analysis, right? You'd have to think about resources and all these other things. That broad kind of pattern is true. And that broad kind of pattern is true because it was made true, right? It wasn't it's not an accident. It's not the outcome of a kind of random process. It's the political outcome of very deliberate and usually very explicit political crafting. Okay, right. And and would you see that as a kind of legacy of the past that still carries over? Or is that something that's that's still being politically crafted today at the international level? I would say it's both. Um, so I think... People are, in some cases, bucking with older trends of um, how global politics is supposed to be managed. The emphasis on diversity, for example, from the capitalist class of 2021 is not a serious commitment to racial justice, but it is meaningfully different from how the ruling class thought of things as recently as 50, 70 years ago, right? It's, it's, a, it's a meaningful political difference. Um, but at the end of the day, I think the broad thing that's happening is that everybody is trying to do more or less the same things that every generation tries to do, tries to achieve material progress, tries to um, protect itself from crises of this or that kind. But there's huge unevenness in the resources and thus practical options available in Malawi as there are in Norway. And if we ask why present day people in Malawi have different options than Norway, the explanation for that is historical. It's not an explanation rooted in what either those people think now ideologically um, or even what their practical aims and aspirations are. So I think the past is folding itself into the present in ways that kind of elide a lot of the ideological distinctions we try to appeal to when we try to interpret who is doing what and why. Right, right. Um, and, and thinking of the kind of prevailing ways that security is understood in the United States and, and other leading nations today, um, how have we ended up in a way in which security is, is so narrowly understood in terms of policing 
and military power. And, and whose interests uh, does that serve? I think we've ended up with this way of thinking about security um, because it's very difficult to argue with success, right? So um, racial capitalism itself represents certainly not a moral victory, but certainly represents a political and kind of economic victory of a certain kind of way of securing oneself and one's interests in the world. What it took to maintain a large scale empire, especially an empire whose labor force was largely implicated in the transatlantic slave trade, was a pr pretty consistent form of coercion and terrorism built into the very operation of the thing. Um, and if you read um, Caribbean labor management manuals um, and articles from the early centuries of this, you know, it was it was explicit. I'm not giving you my kind of um, polemic description of things. I'm telling you what in fact it is to run a plantation or, or a latifundio or whatever it is, right? On top of that, you have the sort of international version of that, right, which has increased in sophistication during the Cold War. Many of these fights between major powers become kind of proxy wars uh, and get filtered through um, presumptively independent national governments. Right, but but it has always taken naked violence and terrorism and extortion for this version of world politics that was built over the last five centuries to sustain itself, for the people on top of these hierarchies to stay there. Um, and what that means, and uh, I, I really liked how um, Jordi Calvo put it in the State of Power um, 2021 report. What that means is you have a version of security, a way of thinking about security, and I think maybe more to the point, a way of actually performing security, a way of actually making security happen in the world that is entirely predicated on fear, right? Um, and the people atop the economic hierarchies that benefit from this are uh, the re typical revolving door of generals and arms companies um, and, they have essentially captured not just the realm of politics having to do with defense spending in their respective countries, um, but increasingly the entire way that the social system operates to make people secure. So when policing gets increasingly militarized in response to the kinds of social problems that result from not having material resources, um, what we're seeing is the logic of racial capitalism spreading from the plantation where it started to the rest of social life. And uh, can you can you say a bit more about how you see uh, fear playing a role here? Um, is it that these fears are real fears that are then diverted into a kind of narrow range of, of possible responses, such as police and state violence? Or is it that the fears themselves are, are manufactured and they're not really based on anything that, that we need to be scared of? So there are cases of manufacturing fears, um, but I actually think most of the fears involved in the kind of regime that we're talking about are, are real ones, right? It, it, it really does become an antagonism when people can't eat except via coercive means, right? Um, that is something that we should genuinely be worried about. The political trick that's happening is in the social conception and the social institutions that could alleviate those fears, right? So broadly, there are security problems because we don't control the world, we don't control nature, and we don't control other people, right? And all those things can possibly, are, are things that could possibly get in the way of particular things that we're trying to do. But we could think of navigating those problems in a variety of ways, 
Um, the two that I think are most helpful for getting to see why the processes and the institutions should, could go a different way are antagonistic security, which is the paradigm of the regime that we have that racial capitalism was built on, and collaborative security. So antagonistic security is the kind of security that you have um, on the inside of a barbed wire fence with armed guards patrolling it, right? It's the kind of security the people inside the scheme of security have from the people on the outside of the scheme. And that's not to say that that's never a called for way of looking at things, but what we've gotten from racial capitalism is a system where that's just what security means as far as the social system is concerned, right? If there's crime, that means police budgets are too low, police tactics need to change from this to this, or so on and so forth. We need different ways of patrolling. We need different ways of aiming guns. And the only way to make us on the inside safe is to make us safe from the people on the nightstick end of policing. Um, but there's another approach to making security and that's collaborative security that's the kind of security we could have had over the past few years if it weren't for vaccine apartheid it turns out that there are ways of generating security where the thing that makes me safe isn't what makes things dangerous for you Right. It's not the thing that will cut your hands if you try to get to where I am. It's not the thing that will shoot you if you try to uh, move in ways that I find threatening. It's the thing that will protect you. Right. Me getting the vaccine protects you from getting the infection and the disease. And that's another way that social systems can in general operate to make people secure. That's the kind of way that we would secure ourselves, not by distributing guns to willing violence workers, but by distributing food and mental health services and shelter to people who would then have better things to do than themselves take up arms. And that's the kind of security that I think is built into abolitionist discourse and that many people who have been talking about prison abolitionism here in the States have been talking about. It's the way that people have been thinking of um, development, economic development in critical ways the world over. You know, it's built into a lot of different ways that people have been challenging the current state of the world. Um, and I think we should you know, lean into the wisdom of those people and activists and practitioners. Mm -hmm. and, and on the idea of antagonistic security as, as this idea of being on one side of, of the barbed wire fence, um, looking at threats on the other side, does, does antagonistic security um, have a tendency to always involve racism? I think it does. It doesn't conceptually require racism but it was built in a political system that was structured by racism. And so typically the inside of the antagonistic security schema are people who are racially advantaged in one way or other, and the people imagined on the outside and the people engineered into having to live on the outside of the scheme are typically the racially disadvantaged, the black, the indigenous, the um, people of color, right? Again, this is one of those things that largely holds up. I think the more globally you look at it, it becomes more complicated the farther down in scale that you go. Right? What this looks like in Jamaica is not going to be what it looks like in the United States or what it looks like in Norway. Right. Um, but nevertheless, um, I think the ways of mobilizing antagonistic security, the presumptions of who antagonistic security should benefit and who is presumptively a target for um, the nightstick end of policing, um, track whatever social stratifications are available that rank people into the deserving and the undeserving. 
Right. And, and you talked about the, the vaccine idea as a way of thinking about collaborative security. Can you say a bit more about how you see these questions of, of security playing out over the last year or so with COVID? I mean, is there, a, is there a process whereby the reality of COVID enables us to, uh, to think about security differently and, and for a collaborative notion of security to, to come to the fore? I think the things that we've had to do and the reasons we've had to do them um, as individuals certainly open the door to thinking about security in a different way, right? Um, a lot of people who didn't feel um, personally scared or put off by the risks of contracting COVID were at least asked to think, well, what if you weren't thinking yourself just as, you know, the center of this political decision, right? What if you weren't just thinking about how these decisions were going to affect your life in particular? And what if you thought of yourself also as a neighbor, also as a person getting on a bus with other people, also as a person going to the store with other people, right? And from that perspective, does it make sense for you to wear a high quality mask? From that perspective, does it make sense for you to take these kinds of precautions? And you know, a lot of people in one way or other resisted that. And I think there are complicated stories to be told about why, but there's also the simple story, which is just that some people haven't been asked to think of themselves in that way. And not having to think of yourselves in that way is in some senses, a good from, you know, what I would think of as a warped political perspective, but it's certainly a political perspective that's out there. And certainly the kind of political perspective you would expect to see after centuries of racial domination, right? Expect that to be a political common sense somewhere. Um, but at the broader level, at the international level, I think that interesting things are happening. Right. We've had all this talk for decades about a rules based, broadly liberal international order. And when the chips were down, all of these rich countries talking about freedom and cooperation, hoarded PPE. In some cases, in the United States' case, um, you know, brought piracy, brought, you know, piracy back to elite state politics, um, which is uh, fun, um, but horrific. Uh, yeah, they, um, they, they literally just stole PPE from other countries in, you know, in the early months of the pandemic response. They've hoarded vaccines. Um, they've reneged on pledges to provide vaccines to um countries that aren't as rich and i think you know the response from uh the au for example the african union um is uh actually a little bit encouraging there's there's some real effort to get out from this kind of reliance um at least as far as vaccines are concerned and to, and to develop um, capacity for research and production um, throughout the 54 member states of the African Union. And I think that kind of that kind of thinking obviously generalizes past vaccines, right? And that's going to have to be as climate crisis accelerates the new normal if the US and the EU and, you know, the more the most powerful countries aren't going to dominate everything in the way that they've dominated the pandemic response. I think what I what I find really useful about the argument you've been making um, is that it gives us a vocabulary for talking about security on the left, and so the distinction between uh, the idea of antagonistic security and collaborative security is is really powerful for that reason. Um, can you say a bit more about how you imagine the left might be able to push forward on on talking about security using that vocabulary on issues of of COVID and and on climate? 
So sometimes, especially in the United States where I'm based, there's an effort to trade off what are thought of as left goals or progressive goals with defense spending. And I think the wisdom of this, I think, I, I think this is exactly right, right? You know, um, you know, there's a there's a group here called Food Not Bombs. And, you know, if I had to summarize my politics in three words, you know, um, I think that kind of approach to things is exactly right. And one other way to tell that story is not just the kind of opportunity cost story, right, where all the money that we're spending on F-35s or whatever it is we could spend on universal pre-K and healthcare and public housing and those kinds of things, which is obviously true and um, I think plenty compelling. But I think you know, it, there's even a further thing that we can say. It's not simply that um, the resources that we use on bad things we could use for good things but it's also that the goal we would pursue be pursuing by way of these bad things will actually be better pursued by way of these good things right so it's not just it's not under the rubric of charity that we should be um contributing money to and resources to green development in the global south. Um, neither is it the province of self-preservation in the kind of classic um, sense, because both of those ways of looking at the world are actually the same way of looking at the world in a certain kind of sense. It's a way of looking at the world where um, what politics is about is what happens to you in particular. And the point of collaborative security is saying there's at least one way that the world could be where that's actually self-defeating right it's actually bad for you and for the world at the same time and for the same reason that you don't share vaccines right it's it's and it's bad for your security not because there's no other way of pursuing security but because there's a better way of sec pursuit pursuing security Right, you could be safe in your house and not be an asshole. You don't have to choose in the way that antagonistic security regimes force you to choose or artificially force you to choose. Um, and the more that we can communicate that to people, um, I think the better. We're not asking for altruism. We're just asking for a healthier way of thinking about yourself and your interests and your security. And on that way, we don't presume that they're separate from other people's in the first place. Right? We're open to the possibility that actually the very thing that you need might be the very thing that I need. And as opposed to this scarcity mindset that drives political discussion around security. And how, how do you see the politics of climate playing out over the coming years? I mean, is there a kind of deepening of the sort of antagonistic approach uh, that you've been talking about? Or um, are there opportunities for us to actually uh, make a different case? I think both are happening. Um, so I think the... The right wing, um, especially those who are in um, the kind of public and private sprawling apparatuses of violence work, the private military companies, the um, border security institutions, the national defense institutions, I think they have doubled, even tripled down on antagonistic security. Um, I think they are um, looking to accelerate securitization of borders. That's another thing I learned a lot about from the State of Power report. I think they are 
um, increasingly trying to raid public coffers for resources to per pursue antagonistic security strategies. The kind of ray of opportunity is that I don't think at any point in my lifetime that the downsides of pursuing that kind of strategy have ever been more apparent to people. Right. Um, and, and by people, I'm including even sections of the ruling class um, other than, you know, from a kind of military capital that runs a particular aspect of social rule. I think even I think even heads of state are even heads of state, even their even their aides, even um, hardcore philanthropy are starting to really rethink um, in general the role of antagonistic security um, in security in general. You know, more and more people are starting to endorse um, aid in the form of unconditional cash grants rather than trying to protect the state from fraudsters, right? Um, I think the vaccine apartheid discussion has opened up um, broader questions about the international order and the role of things like internet, in, sorry, the role of things like intellectual property in protecting and safeguarding the national order um, and the international order. And the question for our generation, just as the political question always is, is which of those forces is going to win? All right, there's always a, it's always deeply heterogeneous political sensibilities in any time. It's no less true in our time than the generations that preceded us. Um, but this is an opportunity for us because, you know, one of the sad facts about the um, disease that's happening is that it shows us a lot of the vulnerabilities of the ways we've been doing things up until now. So I see climate politics inheriting this kind of tension. Um, I'm encouraged by um, the victories of left parties in, in Germany. I'm encouraged by some of the responses to the vaccine apartheid. Um, but Shell and Exxon and Blackwater, and if we're telling the truth about it, Aramco and you know my, Nigeria's petroleum, none of these things are going to go quietly. Um, and we have to be prepared for what it's going to take. Thank you, Femi. Uh, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you.